It's nice to be here. It's my first time in Korea. Everybody's very friendly. So I want to talk about a whole bunch of uh, new algorithms that have come up in the last few years in imaging. I'll use the blackboard for two minutes, not much, uh, just to mention these things. So very exciting new things. Non-local means. Maybe a -N -S. Hope you can see it. Yeah. Uh, compressed sensing. Sensing. What else? Uh, my favorite is L1 optimization. And also, I'm, I'll be finishing the blackboard in a minute, graph cuts. So it's an amazing time. In the last uh, five years or so, about uh, five new or four major new ideas have come into the subject that weren't there before. Well, they were sort of were, but they were put together by a lot of different people. I should mention some names. Non-local means the, the principal guy is Morel, who's a French guy, uh, and some of his students. Compressed sensing, uh, uh, Candez, and Tao, Donahoe, oops. L1 minimization, uh, I love it. Uh, and graph cuts, there's lots of good people. I won't go into it. <coughs> All these ideas have been around for a long time in some sense. But now they are being used in image processing, and some of the results are amazing and revolutionary. So let me show you what this means. Oh, we don't need blackboard. No, no more blackboard. So let me start out with uh, non-local implicit surface denoising joint work with some UCLA people. It's a couple of years old, but it's still relevant. Uh, there's a beautiful new idea in image processing, uh, which is the following. If you have an image uh, U of X, if I can figure this out here. Here it is. Where is it? Anyway, this is, this is the uh, value of the image uh, at a point X. And typically in image processing, what you do is average over X space. This says you should average over U space. You should look at values of the image which are similar to the value where you are. And that makes a lot of sense because most images have repeated structures. If I look at the audience, there are lots of people and they have hair and so on. So there are features that match up and then there are chairs that match up and so on. In fact, when you see an object, you recognize it because you've seen something that looks like it before. So the idea is to use image data in other parts of the image uh, to compare it to where you are and to average it. And if things look similar, they will, they will get big, they will light up. And if not, the noise will cancel out, supposedly. And it works incredibly well. So that's the basic idea. Instead of averaging over X space, you average over U space. It's a brilliant, simple idea. It goes back a long way. Uh, what we did was put this in a variational framework. I'll repeat some of these ideas later. Uh, and you can devise a calculus, which I won't go into. I'll do that later. But this W of x, y, what do I do? <laughs> go back. I'm sorry. Uh, this uh, W of x, y over here is related to the a uh, function I talked about before, that exponential function, right here. And you can devise a calculus and so on. So let me, let me just give you some of the ideas. What you can do is devise an energy uh, to minimize. And what we are going to do here is denoise surfaces. So we're going to view a surface as, uh, as the implicit in an implicit fashion using level set type ideas. And then we're going to denoise the level set function and clean up the surface. Well, the best thing to do is show pictures, and then we'll talk about the mathematics. So here's the idea. The sur a surface is represented by a level set function. This is the crucial transparency. If I can, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> there's going to be a level set session coming up soon. We have a weight function, which is the, the value of the level set function at x minus its value at y, uh, the exponential of that, which lights up when these values are similar and cancels out rapidly when they're not. And then you decay if you're far away from the, the place, but you location. But basically, the main thing you're doing is averaging uh, the values of level set function here with other values throughout space and 
enhancing those values which are similar and canceling them out which are not. And you can build a calculus based on that and you can do very good denoising. Let me show you some pictures. So we're going to compare it with uh, what I used to do, which was total variation, mean, curvature, motion, the stuff that uh, was done earlier. <coughs> and those were the state of the art five years ago. And let's see what we have now. So here's some simple examples. Now I'll give you more detail. This is a trivial example. I mean, not trivial, but a crazy example. This is a cube with lots of noise on it, just made up example. And you want to denoise it. And this is all the information you have, is the level set function of this cube. Uh, then you, this is what you get in the old days, which uh, was basically total variation minimization, or for, image, for surfaces, it's mean curvature motion, more or less. <coughs> and this is what you can get now. So you can go from here to here, including corners and so on. Uh, just by averaging over phi space rather than averaging over x space. And there's nothing special happens at corners or textures or anything. It seems to take care of all this stuff. Uh, so it's, and th these are old results. Other people are doing extremely good results. You can do this using dictionaries of images. People are doing that. And the results are even better. So here's, uh, for example, brain image. It's a cortex. Uh, which is noisy. This is what we got in the old days, which we liked. However, you lose information. And this is what you get now, where you get a lot of data. I don't know if you can get it, you can see it. So you get rid of the noise, but you keep all the intricate details. Basically because you are averaging over phi space and images have repeated structures. So textures and so on get denoised and noise cancels out. Uh, and this is non-local means. That's the first thing I'm talking about. And our contribution was to make a variational problem out of this. Here's the original, so it looks pretty good like that. Here is a hippocampus. Here is the mean curvature smoothing. This is with the latest stuff. And that's the original. <coughs> so one can almost say that denoising is close to being solved. Here is a a noisy city, once again, it's a level set function. Uh, then you denoise it using basically total variation or mean curvature motion or whatever, it's related to that, they're related to each other. And this is what you get now. Corners and everything back pretty easily. Uh, other than, here's the original. You can do this, here's some real data. This is uh, noisy MRI scans. Uh, on the left, on the right, that's the, the denoise. And you can see all the detail here, right? Look this kind of stuff versus that. And you can make it pretty fast now also. Here is uh, the same kind of stuff, noisy and denoised. Noisy and denoised. This is real data. And there are slices of these things. So that's, those are the results. Let me give you a little bit more of the mathematics of all this. So let me switch now to uh, five, four, here we go. So here's the math behind some of this stuff. Uh, Non-local operators. Okay, this is joint work with Guy Gilboa. <coughs> so you want to generalize non-local We've been doing PDE image processing for 20 years, but now we're going to do non-local PDEs. The coefficients are global. They depend on the, co on the initial noisy image. And you set up a differential equation which involves coefficients which look around space. So let's explain how it works. Uh, the basic idea for non-local operators, one more time, is if you look at an image and you see something like, I saw something like this coming in to town, is uh, once again, this stuff gets repeated. And stuff which is different from it does not get, uh, if, you, if, you if you compare this patch to something over here and do that exponential stuff, you'll, it'll cancel out and you get very little contribution. But if you compare this uh, periodic point structure to something over here which looks similar, it will be enhanced and the noise will cancel out. It's a very simple idea. And it seems to be the way human beings denoise, actually. So the idea is to make mathematics out of it. There's an enormous amount of work that's related. I won't go into it. 
Uh, here's some simple examples, but let me talk more about the math, if I can. Okay, so here, here's where it started from, one more time. This idea of these guys, Morell is the senior guy, and the Buatis is really a smart young guy. You, what they did was the following. You take a, a, noise, a function f of x, which is noisy, and you measure some distance between it and its other pixels. And you average, instead of exponential, instead of a Gaussian, you must all be familiar with convolution with a Gaussian. Instead of a Gaussian in space, you take distance between f of x and f of y. And if f of y is a different part of the image, nothing to do with f of x, it will cancel out. Otherwise, it will reinforce. And the upshot of it is that, is that you get an, a non-local average, which enhances uh, the image where you are and removes noise. And the results work ridiculously well. So what we did was, as I said before, was make this into a calculus and maybe improve it a little bit. Uh, you can define a function, so this is the mathematics, if you like this kind of variational stuff. You can set up a variational method which involves the distance between u of x and u of y. You can do Euler-Lagrange equation and do everything we did for total variation and those things for these more complicated functionals. And this w of x, y is very important. That's the this uh, affinity between values f of x and f of y. Okay. So here's, here's the idea one more time. The picture is kind of interesting. Here's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And if you take a patch around here and compare it to other patches, I don't know if you can see, it lights up in this periodic way, right? You see the lights. This means that uh, for a given patch, these other neighbors are going to contribute to denoising this patch. But the other, the other parts of the image will give you almost no contribution. That's the basic idea. And image, look around you. Images are like that. There's always information in an image which is similar to what you see. And the noise cancels out. The definition of noise is almost that it cancels out when you do that. So, for example, you can set up a functional which looks like this. This w of x, y involves that, fun that exponential function. You can set up what looks like a Laplacian. This is a non-local Laplacian. Uh, and you can get, you can, everything that's true for Laplacian, Laplacian is true for this thing. I'll skip all the details. So instead of using the, the, the earliest type of denoising was, was done by convolution with a Gaussian, I would imagine. You know, this is convolution with, this is, instead of convolution with a Gaussian, it's another crazy non-local operator which depends on the distance in f of x from f of y, basically. Okay. So uh, here's all the properties it has and so on. You can get variational methods. I'll skip a lot of this stuff. Everything that's true for the P local PD is true here. I'll skip much of this. Uh, I can show you denoising results, which you've seen already. Let me skip those and go on to other things you can do. Uh, let's, let's talk about, it. for example, you can do supervised segmentation. What that means is if you have an image like this one, you put a black mark in a region that you, where in, in region one and a white mark in, in region two, and then you solve a differential equation with initial data, which is, uh, again, the coefficients depend on the function f of x. So you're using that global information, and then you initialize properly. Uh, and you solve a differential equation with these uh, initial values zero elsewhere and threshold and you get a very good uh, segmentation, very simple type of segmentation. Here's one for example. Here's the initial image. You, you, put, you put user Im, uh, input over here. You solve the differential equation and you get the object and the background segmented very simply just with this initial data. You have to know where, what's inside, what's outside. In a few places, you solve, and then you construct the infinity function, you solve the PD and your threshold. And you get stuff like that. Uh, and you can uh, also uh, put more, put three marks, essentially three marks in here, and threshold three different things, and you can get, uh, no, here, I'm sorry, here you just, you put more, you put more initial data in, and you get a better segmentation. But it's all based on these affinity functions. So it, the mathematics is kind of interesting. Let's talk about it a little bit. Here's a beautiful idea which comes from machine learning. Uh, w of x, y, for our purposes, 
this w of x, y over here is that function, the exponential, essentially the exponential of f of x minus f of y squared divided by sigma or something like that. Something which determines the distance between f of x and f of y. Uh, people in graph theory, in uh, machine learning have been doing this for a long time. They define a gradient to be just the value u of y minus u of x times this uh, affinity function. So instead of doubling the number of dependent variables, you double the number of independent variables, x and y. So you have, this is the definition of gradient in uh, their world, and it's very useful for us. Once you get gradient, you can get divergence by taking an inner product. Uh, this stu I found this stuff in a paper, by machine learning papers by these guys. Uh, and then you can define Laplacians. Uh, I'll skip a lot of the details, but uh, you can you have a Laplacian. Here it is, the divergence of the gradient. The thing I wrote down before. Oops, if I can find it. Where am I? Here it is. Uh, and you can denoise using the Laplacian. Best of all, you can get total variation, which is the integral of the absolute value of the gradient. So this functional is. Uh, what I did with Rudin a long time ago, uh, when we did local t total variation, it's going to be non-local total variation. And you can define a whole calculus based on these operators, curvatures, and so on, all depending on the affinity function. And let me show you what you can do with it. For example, I'll skip some of this stuff. I'll skip a lot of the mathematics. Let's show some results. Here we go. In painting is fun. So here we have a uh, periodic structure. And then we remove this entire region. Uh, and then what we're going to do is minimize this non-local TV business and make it non-local uh, over plus a, a, a f minus u squared. F is what you see here over a region which excludes this region. So this in this in this missing region, we're just going to interpolate by minimizing total variation. The upshot of it is, if you do standard total variation, you get bad results. If you do non-local TV, amazingly, you get exactly the same right answer. I mean, this is absurd. This is too good to be true. But that's because this is periodic. But basically, this kind of interpolation, using information outside the, uh, the uh, missing region in this uh, non-local TV way gives you, in this case, exact interpolation, which is a little bit unusual. But it does work very well. So total variation usually kills textures, but here the total variation is using the textures in the definition. It's using f of x and f of y as part of the definition. Okay. Uh, and this is supposed to explain why. And this is another crazy case. This is a fun case where the original image, you do not know where the missing region is, but all you do is minimize the total variation with respect to this weights that you get by looking at neighbors and add the L1 norm, which does something miraculously. If you do decomposition, minimize this without knowing anything, you get exactly the right answer without even knowing what the missing region was. And all the noise and garbage gets thrown into here. So these are a little bit special, uh, but the, the, the stuff works very well in, in more generality uh, by these non-local variational methods. Okay. So I think I'm finished with this. We have a, so this is topic number one. Uh, I'm going to go on to the other two if I have time. Um, any questions about this? Don't be shy. So this is, uh, <laughs> I know people, uh, I mean, so, so the, the basic idea is you, you replace all local PD operators by non-local operators using uh, this, these weights. And yeah. from that, you, yep. Uh, it doesn't work so well for fractals, but it works. But uh, I don't want to denoise for, for uh, it. Uh, suppose you're some kind of fractal type of image that you could get, like, uh, like a human iris or something. Uh, then it works pretty well. I mean, it's. Yeah, I suppose that's painted with some kind of noise. You, you have to have stuff in there that's repeated somehow. So you can probably fool it if it's. A, if it's uh, uh, something which doesn't have that property. But most images have uh, this repetition in them. And if you have a dictionary of images, just a random dictionary, then the results are absolutely amazing, actually. If you're, because somewhere in there you'll find something that looks like what you have. 
and the other stuff will cancel out. Uh, there are things we haven't done. So your question is a good one. I mean, we haven't adjusted for scale, which is fractal. We have not adjusted for rotation or dilation or anything like that. In spite of that, you saw the results. It still works quite well. And people are, people are doing things like this. So, uh, but, you're, but you're, it's a good question. Yeah, the other one is, uh, say, something like, uh, if, can you make it sort of like an invariant under some kind of a group operation? Yeah, that's like what I was talking about, rotation. So far, it's not. But uh, you could build that into it, or you can do more of that stuff in there. Yeah, but it's extra work, but it's doable. I mean, you have to put rotation in and, and stuff like that. Uh, but the basic idea is that human beings see this way. I really believe that, actually. The reason that little kids can denoise and no confuse trees with their father or something uh, it, is because they recognize stuff that they've seen before, and the other stuff cancels out. It's a, it, this idea, by the way, goes way back. What Morel did was make it into, use patches rather than points which the original guy did. And I must say, the results blew me away. I didn't think I'd see this in my lifetime. But uh, there's more to be done, making it faster. OK, so the next big idea, which is the hottest thing in Washington, probably, except North Korea right now, or I don't know what, is, uh, uh, is compressed sensing. Compressed sensing is a very simple idea. I might use the blackboard for this one. Uh, compressed sensing was known by Laplace, and Gauss ruined everything. Okay. Uh, what happened was, here's the idea. Let me, let me use the black one. I'll get to it. The basic idea is the following in many, many applications. Okay, you have a matrix equation. A u equals f. A is m by n. M is much less than n. For example, you take the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform of something, and instead of sampling it 256 times number of pixels, you sample it in 10 places, 12 places, whatever. And you want to recover the entire function. You can't do that, of course, in general. It's underdetermined. However, what you can do is recover it exactly if the solution you're looking for is sparse. And if well, the matrix has certain properties, which I'm not going to talk about. So the idea is to find u. Now, of course, I mean, you can't do it because it's underdetermined. However, you can do it if you know that what you're trying to do is find a sparse u, u solution. That means that the number of non-zero, this is a mate, this is a vector, of course. u is equal to u1 up to un, and, yeah, and uh, how many is it? m by n, yeah. Uh, but uh, only k or ui are not equal to zero. That's often the case. Uh, and this is robust. If some of them are close to zero, they'll go, at least with my algorithms, they'll go away. So how can you do that? Well, what you want to do is, what they, is minimize the so-called zero norm such that a u equals f. The zero norm is just count the number of non-zero, it's not a norm, count the number of non-zero quantities. That's not a complex problem. It's not even NP-complete. I mean, it isn't much. It's NP you can't solve it in, in finite number of steps in general. However, what these people realize, and what I knew and Laplace knew before me and many other people, is that if you minimize the L1 norm of U, minimize the L1 norm of U such that A U equals F, then you're likely to get something good. There's a precise theorem of Candes and Tau, uh, which tells you when that's true, but it's true in much more generality of that. This is the big punchline. This is a convex problem. The L1 norm is the sum of the absolute value of the uj. Such that AU, if you minimize that, you will get that. And that's, why is that true? Well, there's lots of reasons. The easiest way to see why it could be true, if I can use, let me go over here. The easiest way to see why it should be true is to draw this little diagram. And again, this is really hot stuff. There's millions of applications. I will show you some today. Uh, the bigger the, the you know, military applications, radar, stuff like that, but also um, <coughs> medical applications. Or it is a lot. OK, so why is that true? Well, let's look at the, uh, here we go. We have AU equals F. Let's look in two dimensions. This is the line AU equals F. It's a line, right, in two dimensions. 
Let's look at the L2 unit pole, which is, a, which is a circle. If you move it out, the probability is you will touch this thing over here, which is not on an axis. Ergo, it's not sparse. So the L2, minimizing the L2 in the long gives you probability zero of getting a sparse solution. Minimize the L1 norm. Aha! What is the L1 norm? The L1 norm is, uh, the L1 uh, unit ball, I should say, is like that. Voila. And the probability is one that it will hit this thing on an axis. If it hits it on an axis, it's sparse, right? Because every component is zero except one or a few. And that's why L1 gives you a sparse solution. If you took LP for P less than 1, it would look like this. It would even be more likely to hit it on a sparse uh, location. However, it's not convex, so it's hard to do. Okay, so L1, good, everything else bad. Uh, and Laplace knew that, and he was shouted down a long time ago. Okay, <clears throat> so that's one reason. Another reason is take an example. Uh, take an example, take the equation a1 up to an times u1 up to un is equal to f. One equation in 2,000 unknowns, for example, very, un very over the, uh, underdetermined. Uh, you want a sparse solution. So this is au equals f. If you minimize the l1 of norm of u such that au equals f, what are you going to get? Well, it's easy to figure it out. Take the AJ over here, AJ, which is bigger than all the other ones. Uh, AK for uh, K not equal to J. Take the one which is the biggest. And the answer to this problem will be the following. U is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, F divided by AJ, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's pretty sparse. So the L1 minimization will give you a sparse answer. That's it. Uh, whereas the L2 minimization will give you the worst possible answer. The L2 minimization, the answer will be, uh, you know, least square. So the answer will be U is equal to uh, A1 up to AN uh, times F divided by A transpose A, whatever it is. Like so. And that's about as unsparse as possible. L2 bad, L1 good, okay? And that's their big observation. And that's incredibly important for many applications. Now, that you want to do, uh, under many circumstances, if you minimize the L1 norm, you'll get a sparse solution. Uh, let me give you quickly some examples of where it's useful, then we'll talk more about it. So, okay. All right, so let me get back to it. Let's look at the, uh, where is something over here? Oops. <laughs> I have to get organized a little better. Uh, let me just show you one set of results real fast, and then we'll go. <coughs> I'm sorry. View show. Come back to a minute. Okay. This is part of a presentation I'm going to give you later. Let me just show you the pictures first, and then we'll talk. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> MRI. Okay, this is my favorite. If you ever sat through <coughs> an MRI machine. <laughs> which I have done about a year ago, it's horrible. Uh, you lie there and you can't move your head or whatever the body is. And it takes a lot of long time, it's very expensive and uh, it's very noisy. I mean noisy in your ears, not, I don't mean that kind of noise. So what we can do by minimizing the L1 norm of the gradient <laughs> is in, uh, if you take a, uh, an MRI, I, I'll go through this in more detail in a few minutes, if you take an MRI, what you're doing is, is sampling the Fourier transform of a signal. And instead of sampling all the values, what this enables you to do, this compressive sensing business, is sample 30% of the data. Uh, so you have 30% of the Fourier coefficients of this uh, stuff. This is the correct answer. Uh, if, you're, if you do what people used to do, which is take the other coefficients and make them zero, this is the horrible result you get. So that's one possible interpolation of the result. Another possible interpolation is to minimize, I should write this down, instead of minimizing the L1 norm, for, for this thing, it's supposed to minimize not the L1 norm because you're not looking for uh, sparse functions. You're looking at something whose gradient is sparse. So you minimize the integral of the gradient of u such that this f of u, this matrix f, or 
a sample f, f time, r times f of u is given, g is something. But this is very under sample. So instead of minimizing the L1, this is the L1 norm of gradient, very important one. If you did two, it would be a disaster. One is very important. One is what makes this work. So if you minimize the total variation of this image uh, and you run this algorithm I will tell you about, this is what you get. You go from, uh, oops, where am I? What am I doing? Uh, that's the problem, but I'll get back to it in a minute. Here it is. Um, this is... Uh, after a few iterations, this is very fast, there are a few iterations looks like that. This is what you get after 30 iterations. This is what you have to show the radiologist because <clears throat> it looks like what you want to get. If you run it longer, you get a better result. How could it be better than the original? Well, the answer is this, this method also denoises as well as reconstructs. But if you show it to a radiologist, he'll, get, he'll be very upset because he's afraid the denoising has lost information, so you have to show him this. So we have to stop before... Uh, we get rid of the noise. So let me talk a little bit about it. So now, therefore, the mathematics of all this is how do you minimize? Uh, so now it becomes, how much time do I have, by the way? Let's see. Uh, 16. 16, one six. OK, well, I can do three more topics. So, okay. uh, the question is, how do you minimize uh, the L1 norm of u such that au equals s? And that's our contribution, is to get super duper fast algorithms for that. Let me talk about that a little bit. Okay, let's get to that. Uh, although what I could do is show you more pictures of what we can do with this stuff. Let me do a little bit of that just to show off. Then we'll do the math, I promise. Uh, here we go. Uh, where is it? Things move around. So here we go. This is kind of fun. This is more medical applications. Uh, what we're going to do is show you a, uh, a movie clip of a, uh, what is it? Come on, baby, do it again. I don't know if you can see it. Let's start again. Ah, wait a second. I start all over again. Okay, now you can sort of, what's that thing in the middle? The idea is, uh, this is an MRI, which is very noisy. MRIs are noisy. And what we are doing is tracking the needle. 30 frames a second. So by using these fast algorithms and doing L1 minimization, we can, here we go. Here's an example. Try do it again. Uh, I don't know if you can see that there's a red dot over there, which is, which is supposed to be where the tip of the needle is. Uh, we're working with a ma an emergency room doctor. So this was taken from a dead body. It was horrible, actually. Uh, my student couldn't have lunch for a couple of weeks ever. <laughs> but uh, uh, you can actually, in real time, segment this tip of the needle and find it by using these fast algorithms, basically fast L1 or TV minimization. And uh, okay, that's one application. And yet another application, if I can find it, is uh, where is it? Tomography. Here it is. Tomography. This is yet one more modality of image processing, equally slow demography. Joint work with a lot of smart people. Uh, tomography is the reconstruction of a, a cross section of an object from its projections. Uh, the idea is to uh, uh, take fewer project take fewer projections and less intense uh, radiation. Because every time you get radiation, you die a little, essentially. So the idea is to sit there as, as, uh, using in less time and fewer uh, and less amplitude. And the idea, once again, is you take the you take the Fourier transform and you sample it. Okay. And there's not enough time to go through the details, but basically, it's the same kind of problem. You have a linear uh, equation, a u equals f. <coughs> and you're trying to get the right answer, which in this case means minimize total variation. Total variation is the L1 norm of the gradient. Notice the one down below. That's the analog of the L1 norm for spikes. Uh, so it becomes a constrained op optimization problem. Keep the measurements and uh, minimize the uh, regularization such that AU equals B. And uh, you can do a few more th things about it. But the key thing there is so-called Bregman iteration. And this is Bregman iteration. This is the breakthrough. 
Bregman Aeration has been around for 40 years. Bregman is alive. He lives in Israel. He's about 82 years old. Bregman distance is well known in imaging, I mean in uh, statistics and other areas of science. It turns out this Bregman Aeration is perfect for things involving L1. It just is. It puts the spikes or discontinuities in the right place. So what you do is minimize, you compute an iterative procedure where you minimize J of U such that AU equals B by using, by solving the unconstrained problem. And which is easier for various reasons which I can go into maybe if I have time. And that what you do is solve this problem and update by adding back this error. And very, because of L1, very, very few iterations are needed. So it's, a, it's quite fast. This is what we did for this problem. And there's an explanation for this based on Zauer tech method, which I won't talk about. Uh, you can solve the uh, unconstrained problem very quickly, which I'll talk about in the remaining five minutes. And you can also precondition it, which precondition the you can change a by making it more by making it by, by improving the condition number. And uh, there's the algorithm. Let me just show you some results. So this is, uh, this is what the, they got for this uh, CT scan using filter back projection. This is what we get using our method, and it's as fast as this. Uh, using, this is minimizing, uh, regularizing that, over, that underdetermined problem by using total variation. And this is what it looks like. After one iteration, it looks like this. After two, it looks like that. And after three, it looks like that. And the error is uh, here. So it's pretty fast. Uh, and this shows you that for the same intensity, you do much better than with this filtered pack projection business. Uh, so it takes about eight times as many projections, eight times as much poison in your system to do the same result. Uh, and that's with low fluence and so on. No, don't say thank you. I didn't do that. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about a little bit more about the math. I must have about six minutes or eight minutes or how much? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh God, I can do a lot. Okay, uh, so let's talk. If I can get finally So let me give you some idea of, the, of, of what the algorithm looks like. Uh, this is the same bunch of people, some very smart Chinese guys actually. Okay. Linearized pregnant iteration, skip that. Yeah. Okay, one more time. Here's the problem for the sixteenth time. Minimize the L1 norm of U such that AU equals F. I've got to say A has full row rank. There's many applications. Uh, medical are nicest and noblest, I must say. Okay. Uh, it's a uh, con convex optimization problem, L1 norm, forget this epsilon nonsense. Here's a key, uh, a key transparency. We're going to use the so-called Bregman distance. So you have a convex functional J of U. From that convex functional, you subtract the linear function tangent to it at K and compute this distance. So instead of J of U being what's above the axis, it's what's above this line. If J of U is the absolute value of U, then there's lots of possibilities. Any, any subgradient will do. So that's the so-called Bregman distance between U and UK. It's not a distance in the sense it doesn't satisfy triangle inequality. It's not symmetric. However, it's zero uh, only when uh, it's, it's non-negative and it's zero when U equals UK. And if it's strictly convex, only when U equals UK. And the idea is the Bregman distance is perfectly suited for L1. Bregman iteration turns out to be uh, this algorithm, where fk is what you got from the previous iteration. It's f plus the error you got last time uh, when you're trying to solve this problem when you have au equals f. And in the limit, you converge the constrained, uh, you, saw, you, you, you could converge to au equals f, the constraint. Uh, there is a two-line algorithm, which I will just throw out there. If you do some linearization, uh, one of the key facts is that the L1 minimizer is very easy. Uh, if you minimize, uh, if you minimize the scalar problem, u plus uh, u times u plus one half u minus f squared, min over u, the answer is u is equal to shrink uh, 
How is it again now? It's shrink uh, F mu, which is this quantity over here, or VU, I should say, in this case. V mu. It's a simple formula. So you can minimize this because although this is a non this is a non uh, smooth optimization, it has a very simple formula for it. Okay, so that so we managed to we take that vector value problem which is coupled and diagonalize it somehow, write a two line algorithm which involves thresholding of this type and matrix multiplication, nothing else. And you get very good results. Let me see. Here's, here's the entire algorithm, which I, I could probably, even I could probably program. It's, it's, it's uh, two steps. Uh, it converges, and that gives you a very fast algorithm for uh, solving that constrained optimization problem. Now this theorem, this convergence galore. It turns out that Bregman iteration has been around forever. It's, it's augmented Lagrangian. It is Uzawa. There are many variants on this, which if you do them right, are Bregman. So there's, there's lots of existing theories, some of which we re-derive. But the main thing is that it's exactly appropriate for L1. It works really, really fast for L1 and, and, and total variation and things like that. Let me show you some results real fast. Mm -hmm. There's convergence theorems and so on galore. It also denoises. Let's get to the denoising. That's, that's dramatic stuff. And there's an improvement of it, which is called kicking. Blah, blah, blah. Here we go. But uh, here's... Okay, let's take some simple cases. This is of interest to uh, DARPA because they want to convert analog to digital. So you have uh, a Fourier transform of something which is quite noisy. Uh, and this is, the, this is not that noisy, actually. SNR is 11. Uh, and this is the kind of result you get. It's, uh, it denoises in addition to finding the sparse solution. Here is a signal with insanely high dynamic range, you have uh, signals that go from 1 to 10 to the 9th in magnitude. This is a log scale. And this method gets them all back. You miss it a little bit over here. But you get the location right, the magnitude is a little off. So it's robust even in the presence of high dynamic range. Here is recovery of a sine wave. You have uh, two uh, unknown frequencies and two unknown amplitudes. You're going to sample this function with lots of noise and take a few samples and see how much of it you can recover. You don't know how many non-zero coefficients there are. Here there are two, but we don't use that fact. Okay. So here is uh, recovery of sine waves and lots of noise. The SNR is actually twice that. <coughs> with 20% of, of the measurements, uh, this is what the original function looks like, noisy function looks like. This is what you, re get, you can reconstruct. You get the location right, and it looks good with 20%. And it's a two-line algorithm, basically. Here is 40% uh, is needed. But the noise is much worse, but you still get, you get good results. We always find the frequencies, right? Here is SNR is actually minus 10. I mean, we, my student miscalculated. We needed 80% of the measurements because it's really, really noisy, but we still get the right location. OK. So this is, this is recovering L1. You're going to say, thank you. I hate that. Okay, let's go to the last four minutes. Let me go. Let me show you a really jazzy algorithm, which is probably too much to absorb uh, at this point. But it's called uh, where am I? You split Bregman. It's done by a non-Chinese student, which is remarkable. American, actually. Uh, I gave him a Chinese name finally. Uh, he's a really smart kid. Tom Goldstein, uh, my student. The basic idea is one more time, you want, to de you, want to, you want to solve a problem which involves minimizing something like L1. As I showed you before, BV is good, uh, which is the integral of the absolute value of the gradient, the L1 norm of the gradient. Or you can take the sum of the uh, uh, wavelet coefficients, God forbid. That's an L1 type thing. Uh, what makes these problems hard is there are two things going on. You have a Two easy problems are minimize AU minus F squared, that's differentiable, and minimize this scalar but non-differential problem. What, how, what's ha what makes it complicated is when they're coupled. When you have, uh, for example, the gradient of U, or you have U plus AU minus F squared. So what you can do is decouple them. Here's the basic brilliant idea of my student, uh, which goes back a long way, but is uh, jazzed up by him. And with a little help from me, you, instead of minimizing the uh, uh, this thing as a function of one variable is make a change of variables. Let d equal phi of u, which could be the gradient of u, for example. And you minimize the L1 norm of d such that d equals phi of u. 
minimize the L1 norm of D such that D equals phi of U. So you split it into two unknown variables, but then you may have them equal to each other, uh, or D is equal to a function of phi of U. The traditional way of doing this, which goes back to Courant, or he probably took it from somebody else, given his history anyway, is to put a large coefficient over here and let that go to infinity, and this forces D to equal phi of U. I know I'm going fast, but I'm running out of time. So this idea forces D to equal phi of U. However, it's a bad thing to do because the problem becomes singular when you do that. But that's what people did before. And Goldstein's brilliant idea was Bregman iteration, to put these two terms together, to, t to, to minimize uh, this such that D equals phi of U, which means you can let lambda equal 1. You Bregmanize this part of it. Uh, and the results are amazing. You can solve these problems involving total variation and all kinds of crazy L1 combinations very, very fast. Because in, in a few iterations, D will equal phi of U. Uh, because everything is L1. This stuff only works well because this is L1. If you try for L2, the results don't do anything special. So let me show you some ideas. And basically when you do it, if I have enough time to show it to you, you wind up solving something that looks like Laplace's equation. For example, if you solved uh, this problem, you would wind up solving this variational problem. And when you do that, you can see that you're going to get, when you, when you take away Lagrange of this, you're going to get Laplacian of u plus u with a coefficient which is small. So it's a, you've taken a very nonlinear problem and converted it into a bunch of linear problems, Laplace equation type problem. The reason it works is because when you do the second part of it, you threshold. The thresholding takes you from Laplace's equation to motion to curvature. So you take a, solve a nonlinear problem by solving a few linear problems, <coughs> very few linear problems. So for lack of time, I won't go through the detail, but it's, here's the kind of results you get. You can do uh, 512 by 512 lena in uh, 55 seconds. If you're willing to uh, get rough results, you get them almost instantaneously. So God help me, I don't think graph cuts are going to be, for those who ask me about it, are going to compete. This is very fast and very easy and very versatile. So what happens is the following. Look at this picture. It, it, initially, you have a noisy image. It looks, you take a cross section, it looks like that. After 10 iterations, the location of the edge is in the right place. The rest of the time is to get everything else right. This is the opposite of multigrid, where smooth stuff takes a long time. Here, it edges. I'm sorry, non-smooth stuff takes a long time. Here, edges get in the right place right away. Non-smooth stuff takes, I mean, smooth stuff takes some time to converge. But for images, you care more about the edges and so on. So you get the edges almost immediately because of this L1 business, because the second derivative of the absolute value is a delta function. And uh, so that's the miracle here. Uh, here are some other examples. You can see that after a few iterations, it looks pretty good. Here's the MRI example. The entire MRI uh, algorithm is uh, right here, solved this way. Uh, and I'll show you the results one more time. Maybe I'll quit here. It's, uh, so that algorithm enabled us to do this phantom uh, very fast. I, I don't remember the timings, but it's, it's quite fast. Uh, maybe it doesn't say so here. But anyway, it's uh, uh, a few seconds or less than a minute uh, to do it to go, well, much less than a minute, probably 15 uh, 15 seconds or something, to do uh, this phantom image, <coughs> and I'll quit here. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions or comments?